globally where you have talents who would always um who you need in your company um, most employers of labor what they use in attracting such talents retaining and motivating them is basically compensation and compensation can come in various ways one of the most effective and mutually beneficial forms of compensation is either the stock option and the equity package stock options and equity packages in simple terms involve compensation by employers to employees with the sole aim of getting their commitments and making them have a sense of belonging to the company you would agree with me that when such things do occur um, you would always get the best from such staff because one the idea is for them to see themselves as part owners of the company and when you're part owner of a business you want that business to 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 thrive you want that business to grow um, you would have an owner mentality and not an employee mentality so um, what we'll be learning today as regards employee incentive plan is how we can benefit how the employer and the employee can work together in having this as a plan for companies i'll hand over to my colleague damilari who would then um, take it off from here thank you Please um, just confirm that you can hear me clearly. Okay, um, so um, just like my colleague has said, right, there are um, so many ways um, employees are being compensated for their labor. And I mean, you agree with me that, you know, it is, um, I mean, there's a concept called go congruence, right, which simply means that um, you align um, goals of two different parties together right and you know um equity packages and stock options are one of the most brilliant um tools to achieve goal congress that is aligning the um the the goal of the company with that of employee right every employee wants to grow well for themselves right? and every company wants to improve their valuation and um and their um profit of course so this is one of the, one of the very effective ways to um to do that and um um, in in achieving this, right, one, we're going to talk about employee um, incentive plans, particularly employee stock options. So I might be using employee share ownership plans or employee stock option plans interchangeably. We don't know that they, they mean the same things, right? So um, so let me let's go on to definition of terms, right? Because it's important that we lay very strong foundation so that as I you know call on these terms, you will to um, draw on. On their meaning. So we'll start with grant price or exercise price. Um, this means um, the price at which the shares or the stocks are offered to the employees, right? So I, as an employer, I want to set up this plan or this scheme for my um, employees. And I mean, I'm, I have to decide what price am I going to give to them if they're going to pay for it, right? So it could be zero, it could be um, five naira, it could be, I mean, depending on the denomination, of course. But one thing you must understand that it is, it is always below market price because it won't make sense for me to give a price above market price. Nobody's going to be interested in 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 um, in, um, in accepting that. So let's go to vesting period, right? This is, this is also known as lock-in period, and it is the period wherein your um, the shares allotted to you are in lock, right? So let me use this analogy. I don't know how many of us play games, but imagine you are playing a game that has 10 levels, right? And before you get to level 10, you have to unlock level one, level two, level three, level three, and you know, and so on. So this it follows the same concept, right? So those shares are locked in for a period of time. And as the period progresses, um, your shares are unlocked. So take for example, I want a vesting period of four years, right? It means that if I allot shares today to my to those employees, they cannot access the benefits on those shares until the four years have lapsed. So if I'm spreading about four years, it means 25% will vest annually, right? So meaning on the fourth year, I have 25%, second year, I have 25%, third year, and the fourth year. So by say year four, my 100% has accumulated and, I, and then I can um, access um, all the shares allocated to me. Then let's go on to the next price, the next um, term rather, exercise, right? This is 
um, where the employees um, accept the, um, the the shares allotted to them by paying for them, right? So, you know, sometimes it's um, it's usually given to free of charge to the employee. Sometimes it might take uh, it might cost um, a little amount, but the employee has to show interest by accepting um, those shares, and that is where payment or you know um, acceptance comes into into play. The next exercise period, um, usually there, there's a period within which the employee has to um, exercise this, um, to accept this, this offer, right, or um, pay for the shares allotted to them. So it might be a couple of months within, after which the investment um, period lapses, or I mean, depending on the, um, the way the management wants to do it, it might be over a couple of years, but the, 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 the point is the employees have to pay for the shares before they can actually claim to own them. Right, and then eligibility criteria will be the next, and this simply means um, what are we looking at before we decide who, uh, which of the employees qualify for the uh, for the scheme, and you know different um, things can be used from rank to employment category, date of employment, um, years of service, right? So, and let, let me make a, a slight distinction between years of service and date of employment, right? So it's possible that I say that I want to give shares to um, staff who have been in this company for, say, um, for the last five years, right? And then I say that I want to give um, um, shares to, comp to employees who, have, who joined the company before, say, 1st of January, right? And the reason that might be different is, say, maybe 1st of January was when they went public or when they had a, they crossed a significant milestone and the company is trying to reward those that contributed to their efforts towards that milestone. So um, staff that joined before that milestone will be, you know, will be, um, will might be the basis of their, of their selection. So let's go on to forfeitures, right? And this um, simply um, implies that, um, I mean, like, like the world implies, some parts of the shares might have to be let go, right? And different scenarios can come into play um, that might result in, into this, right? It could mean, it could be because, um, the employee leaves before the vesting period um, matures. So if you have a vesting period of four years and the employee leaves by year one, right? At the end of year one, only 25% of the, of the shares um, are vested. So the employee has to forfeit 75% of the shares, right? It could also um, arise as a result of, say, um, um, dismissal from the company. If the employee probably did something bad or, um, uh, um, didn't you know follow the company policy or did I mean maybe fraud or um, just um, poor performance right that employee is let go and has to automatically forfeit the sh the, um, the shares that were allotted to him or her. Um, the next concept is valuation and this is very important because it's kind of is the bedrock on which the pricing of the shares stands and if the valuation is manipulated or incorrectly placed right, it would impact on the value that accrued to the employees. The employees might end up being overpaid or underpaid, and in most cases, usually underpaid or undercompensated. So, I mean, a lot of things go into the valuation, the method of valuation, even the company that does the valuation, right, and I mean, just to ensure that you have everything um, rightly done. So, let's go into the structure of um, SOP, um, and it's basically, I mean, the crux of the whole structure is that the trust asset, and when I say trust asset, I mean, say either the cash or the shares or, or stock, lie with the trustees, stay with the trustees, because that's the only way the trustees can hold the company and the employees accountable to keeping their end of the deal, right? So the company moves the shares of the cash to the trustees, and then the trustees move the um, shares of the cash to the employees. The nuances might differ, the timeline might differ, um, the procedure might might differ, but I mean this is the basic um, basic structure. Um, let's go on to variations of um, or that um, how SOP runs, right? The, the, what in what shape might they come out? In, in what um, form might they be uh, awarded? And I'll start by um, explaining the timeline of um, an employee share option plan, right? So there are five um, steps that I've outlined here. We have the issue, the vesting, the exercise, the allotment, and the settlement. I'll go over them uh, one after the other. So the issue, like I, I earlier mentioned, is the is the point in time when the shares are allotted to the employees. At this time, notifications go out, probably even um, 
tokenized certificates go out to the employees saying you have awarded X number of units of shares to this company, right? But at this stage, the employee cannot exercise any rights over those shares, right? So let's go on to the on, on to vesting. Vesting, like I explained earlier, is the period wherein the shares are unaccessible, are locked in, right? Because the um, the employees have not either fulfilled the terms of um, claiming those shares, which could be term of, uh, number of years or performance, right? And then on to exercise. Exercise is the um, express um, confirmation by the employee that I am interested in taking these shares. And if the shares are offered for free, that can just be a simple email, letter, or confirmation. And if the shares are set at the price, right, it is simply paying the exercise price. And then um, allotment. Allotment is, Allotment is where the um, the um, shares are given to the employees, and by that I mean, you know, there's an allotment schedule, right, that um, details all the beneficiaries of the scheme, right, all the employees, all the the categories, their their um, levels, and the number of the years to vest, right, and then this allotment schedule records how many employees have exercised. So on this allotment schedule, let's say I have, you know, um, the vesting period has lapsed and I have um, exercised 75% of my shares, right? On this allotment schedule, I am able to, the trustees are able to tell, and even the company are able to tell that this employee has exercised 75% of their shares. So it's just a way of keeping track of, um, of the shares that have been allotted. And then you have settlement. Settlement is the final stage in the um in the compensation process right this is where the cash or the shares are actually transferred to the position of the employee usually at the exit or the um the end of the of the scheme or the plan right so if it's shared it means the shares are then transferred to the to the employee's position the employees take full ownership of the of the shares that cannot be recalled, right? So the company cannot change their mind and say, you know, the employees have to return the shares. And with this cash, it's simple transfer to the employees, what suffices for settlements. Let's see the different forms um, employee share options can take. And um, we there are basically four, right? They might, you know, based on uh, different um, metrics, right? It might differ from one company to another, right? But for whatever employee um, share option plan any company will be um, will be setting up, it usually falls within these four categories, right? Some nuances might differ, but it is usually within these four categories. So I'll start with um, employee stock option, right? And we we'll stock option plans, which I mean, so let me, I know I've been saying SOP things, right? And it's usually, it's like a general name for um, um, equity packages and um, stock options. It's like a general name, but this is, I'm making a, these distinctions here because I want to make specific reference to the terms of, or the um, the criteria for setting up. Right, so um, yeah, options can be converted to equity shares on a future date, where on a future date where um, shares are granted to the employees, right? That means um, I give the employees options, right? And then, at the, I mean, obviously, the, the idea is that the valuation of the company, the shares of the company will appreciate in value, right? So by the, at a date is already, is usually um, set to it. So by that date, on that date where the um, the options have been, have been offered, as expected, shares appreciate and then the employee can exercise because, I mean, the the um, the argument or really the, the expectations that the shares um Appreciate. I mean, the share doesn't appreciate. Obviously, the employee would not decide not to, um, to exercise um, that that offer. Um, and the conversion of the option of conversion of options and shares upon the completion of locking period, the vesting period, like I explained. And then generally post conversion, there is no locking period for the equity shares. And by locking period in this context, right, I mean after the shares have been given to the employees, right. The question usually in um, in the way these things are set up, there's only a period wherein the employee cannot sell the shares after they have been transferred to them. So yes, irrevocably, the shares are the employees, right? They own them, but they cannot sell the shares within that period, 
So that is the context in which I, um, this locking period applies. So generally, there, there's usually no um, um, locking period post um, conversion. Then let's go on to the next, right? Employee share purchase plan, right? And this is similar to the stock options, except that employees have to actually pay for the shares. There is a, what's it called? An exercise price at which um, the stock options are set, right? And I mean, the employees can either pay over a period by um, say maybe X amount is deducted from their monthly salaries or probably bonus packages over the years that are then used to pay for the um, for the shares or the employees at their discretion remit um, the um, value of the exercise price to the company. And then these shares have a locking period within which the employees cannot sell. And then employees, of course, like I said, have to pay for the, um, for the, for the shares. Now on to the next um, category, which is um, stock acquisition rights. And um, I'll lay emphasis on this, um, particularly as it regards to cash, right? So let me, um, let me let me take the two of them together, um, stock acquisition rights, cash based and share based, and I'll um, explain the dichotomy. So um, I joined the company, say, um, in, say, for example, say in 2020, right? And then the shares of the, from the company in 2020 was $5, right? Then five years down the line, the shares appreciate from $5 to, say, $100. Right. So the difference between five and 195, right? So while I was in the company, the shares grew by $95, right? So that difference now becomes the basis upon which my compensation will be calculated, right? So you have, um, you have, so that is based on the, the appreciation um, by $95, my compensation is calculated. So if it's a cash based, stock appreciation right now the company would give me cash the cash value of that appreciation so based on the units have been allotted the appreciation of the um of the shares goes into the competition and then when it is share based right the um compensation is not cash it is actually the the um share equivalent of that value so if the company's um as, as I explained, the company share is 100 by year five, right? The um, appreciation is calculated, and then the um, share equivalent of that appreciation is then awarded to the employee. Um, so, go on to um, a couple of case studies that would um, help bring these um, explanations to, um, to life. Uh, the first example is a banking institution. Um, which is um, a publicly traded company. The, the company issued 500 million to employees and what the trust was basically um, doing was holding the shares in trust, um, maintaining the register of the beneficiaries. Then when the units vest, we credit the individual's accounts. So you, the, when it comes to shares, you have to, of course, you have to open a CSS account that the shares are usually transferred to. Um, then register shares with the regulators. And um, let, me, let me place a little emphasis on this, on why it is important to, um, to carry the regulators along with your um, employee shop from plans, right? Especially for a traded company, a public traded company, because the Activities on your shares can, on share on sale or purchase of your shares can impact on the share price, right? And you don't want the regulators to flag your company for insider trading. So you have to carry them along and explain what you intend to do. You want to set up a scheme for your employees and you'll be, say, if you are issuing second, if you are not issuing fresh shares, you're getting off the secondary market, you are going to have to mop up shares from the public. And this is the period over which you're going to do it. This is the what I've done to ensure that the, I don't tamper with the share pricing by doing this. And then just to ensure that the regulators are carried along so you don't get flagged for insider trading or you know, other related offenses. Then the trustees also notify the beneficiaries, um, transfer shares to off your trust. So in this particular example, the company had listing both locally and offshore um, the trustee was also responsible for transferring shares offshore where employees say, okay, I want my shares 
transfer to my brokers offshore. And then um, managing exit from the scheme, when you have an employee exiting, you calculate how much has vested, how much have they exercised, what is due to them. And then lastly, distribute, receive and distribute dividends. Now, because these shares are in lock-in period for, say, four years, for example, which is generally standard, um, dividends accrue annually. So the question is what happens to those dividends, right? So yes, the employee cannot touch the dividend before the shares get to them. So the employee, the trustees also hold the dividend in trust. Then at the uh, maturity of the vesting period, the dividends are then you know, transferred to these employees. The next example is a FinTech startup. Um, issued 150 million shares to its employees. Um, the, the responsibilities were basically similar to the last one I, I explained. Only that you know, it's not publicly related and there's no offshore, um, offshore transfer. And then um, the last example, a microfinance bank um, that, microfinance bank that um, issued 33 million shares to a, um, its employees. Um, this one was basically designed for management staff, not the general um, um, staff. So um, just the management staff, you know, just motivates them and reward them for uh, their efforts in driving the company forward. And basically, responsibilities were very similar. And this was actually this particular example was actually a stock acquisition right. Right. So no shares were actually transferred. So at the exit of the employee or the authority of the period. Right, the um, stock equivalent, the sorry, cash equivalent of the um, shares are transferred to the um, employees or the management staff using the um, the last valuation of the company, and this basically was how um, this structure ran. Um, so, thank you very much. I'm going to hand over to my colleague to um, continue with the presentation. What's you, Chisholm? This method is one of the have conversations around incentives is one of the reasons why companies can attract, reward, and motivate um, their employees. One of the major reasons behind this is that incentives is the way to keep and maintain the best. And also, in this regard, you now start to see that the employees that you have, their goals align with the company goals. You start to see the company as yours, and it's not just going to be coming to work every day because you own a piece of the cake. So you come to work every day highly motivated to achieve one goal. And it's job satisfaction for you as an employee. If you have this option as one of the incentives in your company, you're highly satisfied and motivated. And also in terms of retirement, you can see that um, for in terms of, of some of the structures that uh, some of the structures that has been discussed, you find out that this is a way for you to um, have it as a retirement plan. And at the end of the day, it's something to look forward to something to look forward to so um can you hear me um so this is also a to um what's the need for the trustee we having this conversation at Trust Company and it's very important to note that um, for accountability in this sort of structures, having a third party who sits an umpire in this transaction would show and and it will show um, serious motivation at the part of um, the company to ensure that these structures work in line with what has cost. But there will be no reason for any manipulation of the valuation of the shares, and there will be no need for the employees to think that there's been some sort of a um, hidden agenda in terms of handling the structures. And in representation, the trustees act to represent the stakeholders. While holding this trust, um, trust um, 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 asset, so to speak, which is the, ch the shares in this instance, we act in the benefit of the st stakeholders without even sitting on uh, sitting on the fence, basically, but also ensuring that things are done as it is. And I will also have legal and regulatory obligations. Um, as, as Dami has mentioned, we're required by law to ensure that uh, some of these, um, in, in the case of a public limited company, for example, that we have the um, the duty to report some of these uh, transactions to the, our regulatory bodies, ensure that fairness and openness in this 
certain sort of structures. So, and an administrative convenience, for example. So, if you, if anyone is in HR will be thinking, okay, um, how am I having these conversations with top management? What can I do? How do we um, marry this with our day-to-day -day work? It's already um, really, really um, cumbersome to handle HR on different companies and now have these structures in place. But if you have a trust company handling this, you take over. We take over the administrative body. Uh, from evaluation even to understanding and structuring what is best for each company because no company is the same. So first, uh, when we have this uh, conversation, we first would like to be appointed by companies or even if um, we, even if employees are having that uh, listening to me right now and thinking these are the ways that they can speak to um, management in the company or even the house in their companies to talk to trust companies like ours and if we have these conversations we first start with being appointed and then we start uh, with um, getting due diligence due diligence in terms of knowing what the company is and who is behind the company getting all the necessary documentations that are required and then we now sit down with management and understand the purpose because of the different variations of these SO plans we understand the purpose and advice on the best uh, structure to take and then now design the scheme around those um, structures. So then we now move ahead to drafting the trust deed. Now, you know, not to trust I like, and this trust deed governs the entirety of this transaction. It means that whatever is stated there that is going to be signed by all parties is what would go through within the lifetime of any of the structure. And then the next step will now be to transfer shares. Um, even if it is cash, we hold the cash and trust, if it's shares, we hold it in our position for the benefit of uh, the employees. And then, like I said earlier, administrating, administrative role would be to handle the administrative um, duties within the lifetime of these structures from registering um, who the employees are, when they exist, when, when they exit the company and when they come in into the company, we handle all of that uh, administrative role. So and in terms of our responsibilities as trustees, like I mentioned, we draft the trustee, we we'll comply with regulations in respect to stamping, registering, and recovering the shares. And in instances where companies have to go a step further, maybe in most cases, um, startups, for example, might have to finance this um, particular structure, particular need or shares. And that means that we would have to handle the repayment of that loan and ensure that, that that's um, the funds that are give are, are taken into our position are handled with due care and carried out to the purpose it is, it is being um, taken for. And, you know, we filed relevant documentations, like I said, to the regulatory bodies, uh, the SEC and the NSC. Uh, we also conduct a feasibility study. This feasibility study is very, very important because here we're able to see what the goals are for the company, the future progress plan, and how this, you know, this gives a rough estimate of the value of the stock. Because as Elia mentioned, if the value is wrong, the employees do not benefit. And they might be unpaid in most cases. And imagine underpaid, you know, overworked, so to speak. So you don't want to have run into such issues. And that's why it's always good to have a company like ours experience to handle some of the activities in these um, structures. So as administrators of service, when any of the structures I have mentioned that have, we have talked about are being set up, what happens in this in this um, stage is we hold shares and maintain the share register register of scheme members so we know everyone um where they, when they when they when they joined the company um what um, the value of the stock was at the time and then what is to be due to them and then we also attend man, uh, management committee meetings for structures where um most often or not um, being person and not is this Food management, management team, uh, we might have to sit in this committee meeting. But even if it's not, it means in most, most some of these meetings, um, a lot is being discussed that might affect other members of the share plan. So we have to be in those committees to, to understand what's going on and give advice on the best way to move forward in case of any changes. And then we have the scheme members. If the trust deed um, stipulates that that's some of the role that, or one of the roles that we can play. And if necessary, we attend um, AGMs and EGMs. Just so as I mentioned earlier, 
we are in the loop of new changes that might affect these key members and that we hold an investive event that we once we hold um, trust assets. So the next will now be uh, what are the documentations that we require from individuals who are willing to start this process with us. Uh, we want to know usual KYC checklists, which is want to know the documents for corporate, for corporate individuals, certificates of incorporation, board resolutions, you know, just saying that the company is willing to set up this um, schemes with us and then we get um, CAC documentations, proof of address and the like. So for individuals who want to know, um, want to know who they are, have their international passport or a voter's card, proof of address and utility bill and the likes. And for individuals who might be um, politically exposed, we also want to know that. And in terms of transaction documents, we've talked about being appointed as trustees to the scheme. We want to also have scheme rules, which is the company's internal policy that there's been a conversation uh, around um, having these incentives for their employees and what the policy is around so that the transaction is in alignment with this and share valuation like i discussed earlier we're going to have the shared value even though it's my at the time it might be a projection to so to speak but at the end of the day it's going to be valued by highly um, rated um, valuers and also under the purview of the trustees and also have schedule of allotments, want to know who gets what at what time at also the right uh, price. And the share transfer forms will be readily available so that it can move both to our position and also to the employees as well. And there has to be board resolutions to create these plans and also to transfer these shares into the position of the trustees and also board resolutions to appoint us. So all of these documentations are very important to have. Why have they? Uh, why yeah, you know, discussing and thinking to set up these uh, plans. So if this has been um, this has been a focus for companies that are listening or has been a focus for employees who think that this is something that uh, would move the companies ahead for startups and even already established companies uh, we should start thinking about having this conversation. So thank you so much for listening to us. Um, any questions or anything that we haven't really done deep is to have a little bit of more time to take questions and draw us back or our attention to something that we haven't really um, touched on properly. Thank you so much for listening. I'll, I'll leave the floor open for questions. But you can also send questions to the chat box now and we would um, answer immediately. Thank you. I have a couple of questions in the uh, current session here. And, uh, so, so when I've answered the benefit of others, I'll, I'll just read them out. So, does the SEC support SOS in Nigeria? Um, so, yes, it's um, supported by the SEC, right? Um, especially for uh, what's it called public content companies, because uh, the shares are listed and the you know, manipulation of share prices can be uh, dangerous for investors. So, yes, in that sense, um, is regulated uh, by the SEC. Um, and that question um, similar does the NSC support um, the SOPs in Nigeria for LCCs, um, for example, startups? Um, so for limited liability companies, it's um, the dynamics um, differ, and that is why the use of trustee is expedient. Right? The, um, this is sort of a very soft regulatory uh, initiative. Right. When you have a trustee in your structure, right, we bring accountability to the uh, beneficiaries, the employees, and the employer. Right. And by that, we mean um, we, we, we share that and transfer to the. Um, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Hello. How about now? Okay, okay, okay. All right, thank you very much. Okay, so um, as I was saying, with respect to um, private companies, right? I mean, it's private for a reason, right? The only um, the only means of accountability you have is the trustee. You don't want a situation where your um, CEOs, your management promises you X number of shares if you work for lesser salaries, and then five years down the line, the company is a the startup is a unicorn, and then you know you're having issues with the amount they're paying you, either they're whopping the valuation or you know paying you less than you deserve. 
right? So a trustee is your best bet at bringing accountability to the table. So no, the SEC might not um, explicitly have regulations for private companies, but that is why you must insist that a trustee comes into, uh, into play. Um, another question, so is it applicable to public traded companies alone, letting on private companies on, on that are not listed on stock So I mean, I just I just did that. Um, another question: Does shareholders um, hold any role in ESOP as their shares are involved? Uh, so okay, okay, okay. Um, so does shareholders hold any role in ESOP as their shares are involved i'm not okay let me let me um reiterate what i understand by your question and the, what, what i understand by your question is um do shareholders are shareholders part of like the general shareholders they part of the SOP, um, employee option plan as their shares are involved so not necessarily if you mean by um hold any road as in are they um do they have their shares in the SOP? no they do not have their shares in the SOP. the SOP is designed for employees or management staff or even sometimes non-executive directors so if your question is do they have any role in terms of the decision making the um the choice of how much how many units to allot in a sense yes right they can um we've seen scenarios where um the ceo right the founder of the company promised employees shares and they put they put the shares they, they gave the employees the shares the stock options out of their own stake in the company right so they did not liquidate by issuing and they did not um, dilute by issuing new shares right they um just carved out a portion of the of the shares they they owned and put into the scheme so in that sense i mean other shareholders might not be involved it's a private affair yes they might be aware but they really do not have any say as to how it is um, it is governed um Okay, so um, if the ESOP is denominated in USD for startups um, registered in the US and are also registered and operating in Nigeria, can your company still act as trustee? Mm, um, I, I might not be able to provide a robust answer to this, right? But if your company, if the company is registered in Nigeria, right, as far as that um, jurisdiction is concerned, yes, we can, right? So. Um, if the company is registered in the US, that I might not. So from 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 uh, my experience, right, there, there was a company. Like I gave a, an example, right. There was a company who was um, who had operations in two different countries, listed in two different um, stock exchanges, and as trustees in Nigeria, we were still able to hold hold shares, right. So um, because it depends, on, and, and again, it depends on the um, structure of that of that company. So some. Some companies incorporate a, a, um, a company in the US, right? And then that company in the US owns the company in Nigeria, right? So if that is the structure, we can only hold shares for the company in Nigeria, right? If they want um, us to hold shares for the company um, in the US, I mean, of course, US laws will be applicable um, to, that, um, to that kind of scenario. But if it's a case where the company in if the company in Nigeria owns shares in the company in the US, right? The dynamics changes because we're holding shares in the company in Nigeria, and as far as that concerned, yes, um, we still have uh, <coughs> jurisdiction over the um, the company incorporated in Nigeria. Do shareholders have to approve shares for the ESOP? So, if it's a PLC, a publicly listed um, company, yes, they have to. On a locally, yes, they have to because I mean you don't want a situation where it's a private affair and it look like the management team is just trying to uh, to go behind the uh, what's it called now the shareholders. But if it's a private company, not necessarily. They can, like the example I, I cited, where the founder carved out shares from his own stake in the company, right? Of course, it could carry um, what's it called shareholders are long if he wants to end their favor he can even maybe throw it to them and make them know but he doesn't necessarily need their approval for um um for the for him to transfer um shares to the company i mean of course this is subject to proper legal guidance um on those companies but this is just uh, this is just in my own opinion 
Um, do we have any other question? I think I've answered. Okay, so, okay, so I think I have a, qu a question here I'd like to address. Would you advise that companies should allow itself for its employees? I often shares within, yes, apparently this, this is a very key question in terms of everything we've discussed. Yes, it's advisable, um, depending on the purpose for which um, that decision is being made. If it's as an incentive, as an incentive to employees, as I said earlier, it retains and allows the company to get the best of the best within the workforce. So we are absolutely advising companies to start thinking about the best structures within this plan as incentives for your employees. Okay, so there's another question here. Um, for a company regulated by CBN, do they need to seek approval from the regulator before um, they go ahead with the SOP? Um, so for one, it depends on the um, structure or the variance of the SOP, right? Where, you know, it's a stock operation, right? That's cash-based, right? Maybe not necessarily, it's an HR decision, it's a management decision, right? Um, where the where it's um, share based, right? I, I'm not very familiar with um, civil regulations and rules, so I might not be able to speak explicitly to that, right? But when it is shares that uh, um, when it is shares involved, one would have to go through the CBN guidelines and rule to you know to examine what is obtainable, right? So, but what when cash is involved and it is um, within the company, I think it's I think it's something that the management can um, can. Um, go along with. And let me just share this. Um, I don't know if I should call it share this wisdom. Right? There was a situation, there was one situation where one wasn't clear as to maybe um, the interpretation of the. Um, sorry. So there was this um, circumstance where we weren't very clear as to the application of the regulation or if the regulation was actually even concerned with, with that, right? With that aspect of what we're, what we're trying to do. But to err on the side of caution, we, you know, largely the regulators, I mean, I'm sure every company that is regulated has a compliance unit. It's as simple as making a phone call to um, your contact at the, um, at the um, regulator's office and then just, you know, get their feel on that situation. So you don't want to go ahead and then find out that, oh, you are in error. I mean, you've erred, right? Or this decision does not sit down with your regulators and then you're trying to do damage control and all that. So just to on the side of the question, of course, you want to just check with your regulators and get their feel on, on those um, gray areas per se. Okay, so I think we've covered 